Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm a business lawyer and entrepreneur. I've been practicing for about 15 years. And before starting the practice of law, I was in real estate and even started and sold my own business. So I understand business not only as a lawyer, but as an actual business person. I cut my teeth in big law where I represented Fortune 500 companies, and now I represent small, mid-sized businesses through Johnson Law, which is a business firm and does corporate law and the things that I'm going to talk to you about today. One of the biggest issues I see with smaller businesses is the level of um, attention that they give to their governing documents. So what do I mean by governing documents? If you're an LLC, the governing document would be the operating agreement. If you are a partnership, the governing document would be a partnership agreement. And if you're a corporation, the governing document would be the shareholder agreement or the buy-sell agreement, and maybe even the bylaws, although those are, are, are pretty templated, but they could have some special provisions governing the, the corporation. And essentially what the governing documents do is that's a contract between the owners, if you want to think it's simply like that. And it's a really important document. It's not a form. It's not something that's just pulled offline and let's just sign this because we just need to have one of these. In many cases, you don't need to have one. And if you don't have one, then there are default rules that apply, and I'll go over that later. And that could be good or bad depending where you are, whether you're the majority owner, whether you're the minority owner, what you're trying to do, and what the actual dispute later is. Because if you think about it, 60% of marriages end up in divorce. And those marriages are bound by things like love, sexual relations, children, other things. So imagine how many business relationships end up in divorce where they're not bound by those same things. The only interest in a business relationship is making money, really. There might be some friendship, things like that. But other than that, you're there to make money with your partner. And many partners disagree on things later on. They typically start just like a marriage in, in really well. They're getting along and, and this business is going to be nothing but a success. But unfortunately, years later, or sometimes, you know, shortly after, a dispute erupts. And then they come to an attorney and the attorney will say, send me your operating agreement, send me your partnership agreement. Let me look at the governing documents and see what agreements you have in place that control this situation. And unfortunately, I can't tell you how many times and it pains me to see this where I can't help the client. And I have to tell the client that well, you just pulled this offline, didn't you? You pulled it off legal zoom. They're like, yeah, you know, you, you just, you just did this yourself. You used chat GPT, right? Yeah. You didn't really understand what you were doing. Yeah. And then those are the cards that I'm dealt. So then they're asking me to perform miracles, but in the very beginning, it wasn't set up properly because they didn't see the importance of it. They didn't see the importance of spending money up front to have a really good contract between the owners of the company. And that's why I call this presentation Governing Document Disasters. And what I've done here is I'm going to give you four real life examples. These aren't made up. These are actually examples that I litigated over my career. And I went back and I looked at the governing documents. I looked at the facts and I'm laying them out here for you so you can see what kind of problems could arise later with either poorly drafted governing document, poorly drafted provision, or maybe even no governing document at all. So let's begin. I'm going to start with the trading company. I don't remember what they traded, but they developed some kind of algorithm where they were performing trades and they were, and they were actually doing quite well. Then it was a small, small LLC. There was a company agreement. We call them a company agreement in Texas, but you can just think of it as an 
operating agreement. And one of the members was arrested and raided by the FBI and charged with possession of kitty porn. Small children underage on his computer. There was a news story about it. And the other members were understandably very disturbed. And they were like, this, this isn't the guy we went into business with. And our clients are seeing this and our customers are seeing this. And this is reflecting poorly on the company is harming the company, damaging the company's goodwill. Now, this company actually spent some pretty good money preparing an operating agreement. And there was a provision, and you'll see this in custom operating agreements, where a member can be expelled under certain conditions. And I really like this provision. It's a really good one to have. But there were some problems with this provision, maybe something it was missing and which erupted in a dispute. And disputes typically cost more than it would just to deal with the problem up front in the contract. So the good news, good news is like I said, is there was a provision in the operating agreement allowing us to expel the other side for cause. That was the condition under which a member could expel another member. In this case, for cause included being arrested for a felony or some other crime that reflected poorly on the company or the other members. So the bad news, there was no provision determining the value of the membership interest of the expelled member. So I see value as one of the things that's oftentimes fought over. And so I like to provide different types of mechanisms for valuation in the operating agreement. One, if we're just going to determine value under any ordinary circumstance. And another, if we're going to determine value in the instance where a member is terminated for cause. Now, look, if you don't have a termination provision at all, and I see this too, you can't get rid of the member's membership interest at all. They can just resign. They could do nothing. Resign as an officer. They could do nothing. They could just sit back and they can wait it out. So the, the termination provision is great, but having a valuation provision is even better. So what happened here? Well, we had a lawsuit and we fought over the valuation of the company. We had to get competing valuations. We ultimately went to mediation and we ultimately settled on an amount. And even though we settled fairly early in the case, our client, just our client, spent about $60,000 in legal fees fighting over the value of the membership interest of the partner of the member that they were buying out. So here's another one I thought was pretty interesting. This was an interactive museum, like one of those storefront uh, in a retail shop center. And they have like art pieces, but more in a contemporary sense, lit up with lights and kids walk through and it's very interactive and it's very fun, very entertaining business. And it, and it did really well. It went to 10 million in revenue and my client was ousted from the company and stopped receiving distributions, but kept receiving K-1s. So, so let, me, let me go over this a little bit. And so he couldn't afford to pay the taxes. So here's the thing with it was something like an LLC, a pass-through company, the profits of the company are passed through to the owners of the company. Okay, so the company will file a tax return. A K-1 will be issued to each one of the members reflecting the amount of the profits that are gonna be charged to that member. Now, these profits that are made by the company to be charged to the member, they don't have to be distributed to the member. I mean, like write a check to this member, like actually give them cash. So the company could keep making profits and not make any distributions to the members. And what would that do? Well, it creates a tax liability for the members. 
which might be okay for some members. They may not have a problem cutting a check, but for other members that are maybe living paycheck to paycheck, for them to receive a tax bill, but no cash is a big problem. You can literally be bled out of the company. So I'm gonna read this provision right here for you. It says, distributions from cash shall be made to the members pro rata in accordance with their me respective membership interests at the times and in the amounts determined by the managers. Notwithstanding the foregoing, to the extent the company has sufficient cash flow, the members may cause the company to distribute to the members an amount of cash sufficient to permit the members to satisfy their federal income tax obligations with respect to income allocated to the members during a taxable period. That last part I read is the tax advance provision. And it says the managers may make tax advances to cover a tax liability. And it says that distributions are determined by the managers at the times and amounts determined by the managers. Okay, fair enough. Who are the managers? The admission managers of the company shall be, and I just put in brackets, the other side, who is the permanent manager and the client, the person that came to me seeking advice. The permanent manager shall serve until his resignation. Each other manager shall serve until his or her resignation or removal by a majority consent. Well, guess who had the majority in the company? It was the permanent manager. Okay, so what's the issue here? The potential client, the client, had only 15% of the company. And so the other party removed my client as a manager of the company. He couldn't reinstate himself as a manager. He, he had no say in distributions. The other side had full control over distributions and tax advances. So what did this effectively do? It financially squeezed my client out of the company. It essentially ousted my client from the company. So did the other side do this intentionally? Did the other side draft this operating agreement intentionally? I absolutely think so. This was not an off-the-shelf operating agreement. The whole preparation and drafting of the operating agreement was controlled by the other side. The other side used an attorney, and then my client didn't use an attorney, didn't negotiate the operating agreement, and then was left with this, which is a huge loss. So you could spend a couple thousand dollars hiring an attorney to negotiate provisions in an operating agreement when you're forming the company, or you could lose a company that's making $10 million a year and is highly successful. If effectively, he, he lost out on that company. He was squeezed out. And that's, that's a very sad result over what could have been prevented with a fairly minimal investment on the front end. This is another interesting one. This is a real estate agency, very prominent in the area, had over 100 plus agents. They were in business for a while, growth stalled, costs increased. The two members disagreed on the course of action. And you'll see this a lot. You'll see disagreements arise when a company is losing money, which makes sense. You'll also see disagreements arise when a company is making a lot, a lot of money. So when it's a kind of on the extremes of things, you'll see more disagreements tend to erupt. There was an expulsion provision. I talked to you about something similar to that. And the other side invoked it on my client and tendered $14,000 as the valuation for the expulsion because there was a valuation pr provision here. Then they went ahead and locked my client out of QuickBooks, locked him out of the office, and announced to the other agents that she had stepped down for family reasons. My client was really upset. None of this was true. And my client didn't use an attorney when entering into the operating agreement. We're starting, starting to see a little bit of pattern here, right? 
Here's the expulsion provision. A member may be expelled by the company by unanimous vote of all the members, not including the member to be expelled. If that member has willfully violated any provision of this agreement, committed fraud, theft, or gross negligence of the company or one or more members of the company, engaged in wrongful conduct that adversely and materially affects the business or operation of the company, such a member shall be considered a defaulting member and the other company or other members may also invoke one of the remedies provided for in Article 15.01. I remember reading this the first time. It was pretty good, but there's cross-references, which certainly makes this confusion, and you have to look at other provisions to actually figure out what's going on here. Another thing, I'll just cover this real quick. Who determines cause is not defined. The other side didn't say with specificity what the grounds for cause were for terminating my client from the company. So what I did, the defensive posture I did, is I said that there was no cause and the expulsion was invalid. So even though there was this expulsion provision, which I think was pretty well drafted, and this form that it was pulled from was a, was a good form. I've seen this provision before. This was not a legal Zoom form. This wasn't another form. This is actually a pretty top end form, but I, as a litigator, looked and I tore it apart because that's what litigators do. Litigators look for some little discrepancy in there where they can make an argument for their client's benefit. So I said, look, who determines cause is not defined in any way. There was no cause. You're full of it and the expulsion is invalid. Okay, so where's this value? I told you there were cross-references and it, and it referenced 1501. And, and so I just pulled the relevant provision here. For sale of the defaulting member's membership interest at fair value and upon the terms of purchases provided in Article 14. So that's, that's how we're gonna value it. We're gonna call it fair value. Okay, we have another cross-reference, so we're gonna have to go. Okay, 14. The fair value of a membership interest shall be the amount that would be distributable to the member holding such interest in the event that the assets of the company were sold for cash and the proceeds net of liabilities were distributed to the holders of all membership interests pursuant to this agreement. In the event that the fair value of a membership interest is to be determined under this agreement, the manager shall select a qualified independent appraiser to make such determination and the managers shall make the books and records available to the appraiser for such uh, purpose. The determination of fair value by such appraiser shall be final, conclusive, and binding on the company and all members. Okay, super interesting fact that I didn't go over that happened before the parties even went to the attorneys. They tried to work this out themselves. They went to an appraiser. They agreed on an appraiser. The appraiser valued the company. And then one of the parties, I forget which one, reached out to the appraiser and said, are you sure that this valuation's right? And the appraiser was like, yeah, kind of makes sense. I think, you know, I can adjust it. And then gave another valuation. So that same appraiser gave two different valuations because one of the parties advocated for a different value. I mean, think about it. Typically, the person that's buying out the other party wants to pay less. <laughs> the party that's being bought out wants to be paid more. So they actually convinced this appraiser to do two different values. So which value is binding? I have, I have no idea. It got really confusing. And I'll tell you why the appraiser was able to do two different values, why it made sense to him. He was trying to follow this valuation provision. This was pulled from the same form, and a very reputable form from a very reputable company. And I will tell you, this is FUBAR. So it says fair value. It doesn't say fair market value, but it uses that word fair, okay? Fair market value would typically include the goodwill of the company. And with a lot of service businesses, especially a real estate agency, there's going to be tons of goodwill in the company. They don't have 
machines and heavy equipment and things like that that are actually hard, tangible assets on the books. It's mostly the name, the goodwill, the reputation in the community, the things that make it more valuable in excess of the hard assets. But then you look at the definition of fair value. It says in the event the assets of the company were sold for cash and the proceeds net of liabilities were distributed to the holders of all membership interests. Okay. The assets were sold for cash. It almost makes it sound like that's let's just sell the hard assets of the company, just like a fire sale of hard assets, take out the liabilities and that's the rest. But on the other hand, goodwill is technically kind of on that asset side when people are looking at it generally, even the goodwill is, is an asset of the company. So if the assets were sold for cash, this valuation provision is not clear whether you include goodwill or not. The party that terminated my client was claiming that goodwill is not provided. That's how she was able to get to that calculation of $14,000. And my client felt for 10 years of building a company up to 100 plus agents, she was entitled to way more than that amount. Okay. So like I said, definition fair value unclear. The other side argued book value. We argued fair market value. And this appraiser did it two different ways. I already went over all that. So the result, we mediated the dispute pre-litigation and we settled for much more than we were originally offered. I mentioned that my client didn't pay an attorney to have the operating agreement reviewed before signing. And my client ended up paying 10,000 in legal fees, not including the mediation fee up through settlement. Very, very good result. And it may have felt like a lot of money to my client. We didn't even go to litigation. Yes, it was 10 grand not going to litigation. That is really, really cheap. I was super efficient. I went straight to mediation early in the dispute before even going to litigation. This could have ballooned into way, 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 way bigger of a deal. The next example, we have a fire suppression company. So they do like commercial sprinkler systems and these large buildings downtown. This company had 30 million in revenue, two members, no operating agreement. What? No operating agreement? Well, they actually hired an attorney to prepare an operating agreement. They didn't sign. I see this so often. They hire someone, they're like, we need an operating agreement. The attorney sends it an email and the clients just never signed it. So we went under the assumption that there was no operating agreement. So what did the other side do? I fired my client's wife and administrator, locked us out of QuickBooks in the bank account and told the clients we're done. They said, you're out, you're out of the company. So but what did I say? I said, well, essentially we're not out because you can't terminate a member, okay? So there's, there's the default rules in Texas is, under, is in the Texas Business Organizations Code. Let's go over some of the default rules. One person, one vote. There were, remember, two members. I don't care if that other member had 99% of the company and we had 1% of the company. It doesn't matter. One person, one vote. You're treated that way. So first of all, tiebreaker on terminating someone. He, he couldn't do it anyway, or he couldn't remove us from QuickBooks. He couldn't make any of those des decisions. There was a dispute actually over how much membership interest each had. There, there was what was stated in that unsigned operating agreement. There was also differing K-1s that were issued that showed different ownership interests. So like I said, you can't get rid of member and that's the position that I took. We're a member, screw you. We either need to agree on some kind of buyout or we need to dissolve and there's a procedure for judicially dissolving a company. I, I like to think of it as like the nuclear option. Like if we can't agree, then boom, we're just going to blow the whole thing up. Okay, the result, we sued first. So strategic on our part, we didn't wait to be sued, ousted. We went heavy and hard, get leverage on the other side, increase their legal fees, force them to a decision. The client tried to settle it himself for probably six months to a year before 
The other side hired an attorney. Then we got hired. And then there was back and forth. And then I maybe once or twice back and forth. And then when I saw that we were just running circles, no, 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 I'm not going to waste time on this. We sued them. They counterclaimed to judicially dissolve the company. And we postured the case through other forms of leverage, like discovery and other things to mediate the case. We actually had an informal settlement conference where we met with the attorney on the other side and came up with a, a roadmap and then went to mediation after that. And, and even though there was a roadmap, there were still a lot of disputes and violations of the roadmap because this is what they do in partnership divorces. The parties are very emotional and very heated. This company is their baby and, and they're just nasty. So we entered this mediation wanting to buy the other side out. But then at the mediation, the whole thing got flipped and we agreed to be bought out. And I've been doing this long enough, I know. It must have been kind of disturbing for my client to be stuck on, hey, I'm going to buy them out. And then he ended up getting bought out. But, you know, you go into these things with an endpoint in mind, and then you remain flexible. And it was actually a really, really, really good result for my client. We settled on favorable terms. My client didn't have any kind of non-compete or anything. He took the money and he went ahead and started a competing company. So how much did this cost my client? About over 30000 in fees. And that, that was really good given the amount of work that we did. Could, could have been a lot worse if, if we had gone further down the case. So those are some real life examples of why governing documents are actually really important. They should not be glossed over. It shouldn't be like, oh, you know, I don't want to spend much on this. Let me just pull a form online. Let me just see what forms out there. If you pull a form, you're going to get what you get. And it's just going to be a standard middle of the road thing that's not going to serve your interests, whether that be the majority, whether that be the minority, whether you have special requests. When you hire an attorney, that attorney is there to protect you. They are going to look at the document, prepare the document with you in mind, and specially tailor that document to do little things to protect you. Little things, like some of the things that I mentioned in this presentation, like a valuation provision or an expulsion provision. There are dozens of provisions that I haven't mentioned, but that are equally applicable to, to protect you. And, that, and that's what we do in representing our clients. If you ever want to talk to me about governing documents or about any corporate issues, m and issues, feel free to schedule a 15-minute consultation on this Calendly link. Our firm does not only governing documents, but we also do mergers and acquisitions, securities work, business litigation, real estate work. We're a full-service business firm, and we'd be happy to chat with you anytime. Thanks.